Peggy Carr's life had never been very easy. She was born in 1947 in a very small rural town in central Florida to parents who were deaf and who had almost no money. So from a young age, Peggy had to go to work, except the only jobs she could land were either extremely low paying or they were just outright dangerous, like overnight shifts at isolated truck stops on deserted highways where she would waitress there all by herself. But Peggy never complained about her job prospects. Instead, she just took whatever jobs were available because she knew that she and her family needed the money. And whenever she was working in a dangerous environment, she would intentionally put on this very tough exterior to make sure no one attempted to take advantage of her. And despite her small stature, she quickly developed a reputation amongst her coworkers as somebody you did not want to mess with. Peggy didn't take crap from anybody. But while this kind of prickly outer shell protected her from potential predators, it also warded off potential romantic partners that might have been interested in her, but were kind of intimidated when they interacted with her. But eventually, one man would cut through Peggy's defenses, and they would fall in love, and they would get married, and they would have three kids together, and everything was great until it wasn't. The marriage would crash and burn, and so by the mid-1980s, Peggy was a mid-30-somethings divorced mother of three teenage children who had to work overtime at a local diner just to barely make ends meet. And while she still acted very tough and composed when she was working or when she was out in public, when she was behind closed doors at her home with her kids, they saw the real side of Peggy. And that side was just kind of sad. I mean, life had just been kind of hard on her and she had tried so hard to provide a safe and happy home for her kids and she felt like she had kind of let them down. But her kids, on the other hand, were not bitter towards their mother for the divorce. It just pained them to see her so upset. And so her kids really hoped that one day their mom would meet somebody new, she would fall in love all over again, and maybe that would put a smile back on her face. And in late 1987, that is exactly what happened. That year, Peggy met a man named Perry Ellen Carr. Perry Ellen, who just went by his nickname, Pi, was a lot like Peggy. He was a recently divorced single father of two teenage children. He didn't take crap from anyone. And like Peggy, he had been kind of forced to start working at a fairly young age. When Peggy met him, he was living with his two kids in another tiny central Floridian rural town called Alturas and he was the foreman of a local phosphate mining company there. Phosphate is a chemical that has a number of industrial and consumer uses. So Peggy and Pi, they start dating, and right away, Peggy's kids notice this huge shift in their mother. I mean, now she's all smiles, she's so happy. It seems like Pi is the knight in shining armor that's come to save the day. And then, just a couple of months later, in April of 1988, Pi and Peggy would get married, much to their children's excitement. And then after the marriage was finalized, Peggy and her three kids moved in with Pi and his two kids in his home in Alturas, Florida. And for a while, this newly blended family worked out perfectly, even though they were living in a fairly small house. And so all five of them were kind of all over each other, but they got along great. And it was kind of fun to have so many people in this house all the time. It was kind of crazy and hectic. And overall, the house just felt like it was bursting with life. But within a few months of Peggy and her kids moving in with Pi and his kids, Peggy and Pi started to have marital issues. It was like all their early chemistry had just totally vanished and in its place was nothing. They basically completely resented each other and everything they did upset the other person. And then adding fuel to the fire were rumors that began spreading around this small town where everybody knows each other that Pi was apparently back together with an ex-girlfriend. And so he was having an affair. And so Pi, he denied these accusations, but Debbie totally believed them. And so their fights got worse and worse and worse. And the more they fought, the more a wedge was kind of driven down the center of this blended family, where Peggy's kids automatically took their mother's side and Pi's kids automatically took their dad's side. And so from the outside looking in, it seemed plainly obvious that Pi and Peggy's marriage was not going to last. But before their marriage could fall apart, something totally unexpected happened that would link these two families together forever. 
in late October of 1988, so seven months into Peggy and Pi's now very rocky marriage, Pi suddenly got up one morning and just told Peggy he was leaving for the whole day to go hunting. This was not a planned trip, he just wanted to get away. And at this point, neither of them wanted to spend any time with each other, so Peggy didn't care. She said, go ahead, enjoy your trip, I'll see you later. And so Pi, he leaves the house, he gets in his truck, he drives off, and then a little while later, Peggy and her daughter, Sissy, they both get their things together, and they head out, and they get in Peggy's car, and they drive into town. Both Peggy and her daughter worked at the same diner as waitresses, and they both had a shift that morning. And so they arrive at the diner, they both get out, they go inside, they get their things on, and they begin their shift like normal. But not long into the shift, Peggy was about to walk up to one of her tables when she noticed her heart was racing. And she had not been running around the restaurant, she had not done any heavy lifting. There was no reason for her heart to suddenly be beating at a really fast clip. And so initially, Peggy tried to just ignore it, thinking that her heart would slow down and she would go back to normal. But when her racing heart persisted, she walked away from the table she was waiting on and snuck off into the staff bathroom and she sat in one of the stalls, she shut the door, and she just sat on the toilet waiting for her heart to stop racing. But as she sat there, not only did her heart only continue to thump like mad, but she started to notice her legs were tingling and so were her arms. Now, Peggy was a no-nonsense person. She was not prone to panicking or overreacting or anything like that. And so as she's sitting there feeling these symptoms, it dawns on her that maybe I'm having a heart attack. And so she decides, okay, I'm gonna deal with this. She stands up, she opens the stall door, she goes to the sink, she washes her hands, she washes her face, she kind of calms herself down, and then she walks out of the bathroom, she goes right into the staff break room, and she tells her daughter, I think I'm having a heart attack, but don't worry, I'm just gonna go home, I'm gonna lay down. If this gets worse, I will go to the hospital. But for right now, I don't really know what it is, but I wanna take it seriously, so I'm gonna leave for the day. And so Sissy is looking at her mom, really concerned, but Sissy knows what her mom is like. Her mom is tough as nails. She is the type of person that's gonna sleep off a heart attack. And so she says to her mom, okay, you know, go home. I'll be sure to check on you as soon as I get back and please call me if anything changes. And so Peggy, whose heart was still racing and her arms and her legs were still tingling, she told her daughter, you know, everything's gonna be fine. And then she told her manager that she was leaving. And then Peggy slipped out the back door. She got in her car and she drove back home. When she got there, the house was empty. So she just went inside. She made her way to her bedroom and she lied down in her bed to try to get some rest. That afternoon, Peggy's son, Dwayne, came home from high school, and when he walked inside, he found his mother laying down in her bed. This was very unusual for Dwayne, because his mother never took naps. In fact, he could not recall a time ever that he saw his mom napping, even when she was sick. And so concerned, he went into her bedroom, and she was facing away from him, and so he kind of jostled her awake. And when his mom rolled over to face him, her face was pale, she was sweating, she obviously had not been sleeping, she was gritting her teeth, and it looked like she was in a lot of pain or some sort of discomfort. And he said, Mom, geez, are you okay? And she would say to him, oh, no, I'm fine. I'm just sleeping something off. I got I got something going on. I think I have a flu or, or something. I don't know. I, I took off from work, so I'm just sleeping it off. And so Dwayne, he knows his mom is tough as nails. And if she says she's going to sleep something off, then she'll be just fine. And so Dwayne said, okay, well, you know, let me know if you need anything. And so Dwayne began to walk away, but his mother would actually flag him back and she would level with him and she would tell him that actually something is wrong here. I feel like someone has poured fire down my veins in my arms and in my legs and it is excruciatingly painful. And so Dwayne is hearing his mother say this and he knows his mother is not the type of person to complain or exaggerate or anything. She is just straight, no nonsense. And so for her to say this is the most excruciating pain she's ever been in and she's laying in bed unable to move, he knew this was really serious. And so Dwayne began telling his mom that you gotta go to the hospital. We need to get Pi here to drive you to the hospital or we need to call an ambulance, but something needs to be done here. But despite the pain she was in, Peggy was still a little bit reserved about it. She thought maybe she could just sleep it off. But as they're having this kind of back and forth about what to do, 
Pi would return from his hunting trip. He would come in the house, and right away, Dwayne would run over to him. He would explain to Pi, hey, this is not normal. My mom never, ever acts this way. She never complains. This is really serious. You gotta take her to the hospital. But Pi would actually say, nah, she's fine. I'm sure she just has a fever or maybe the flu. Yeah, she'll sleep it off. But when he walked into the bedroom and he saw his wife looking so horrible and literally squirming in pain, he relented and said, okay, I'll take her to the hospital. And so Pi would have to literally carry Peggy out of the house, put her in his truck, he drove her to the hospital and then had to carry her into the hospital. And by the time Peggy was under doctor's care at the hospital, she no longer could talk. She was just moaning in agony from this excruciating pain in her limbs and her heart was still racing and she was nauseous and she was vomiting. I mean, she was really spiraling quickly. And so after she's been admitted, the doctor turned to Pi and to Dwayne and to Sissy and to the other family members that had assembled and they asked them, do you have any idea what could have caused this? And they all said, no, she just suddenly started feeling this way. And so the doctors who were unable to ask Peggy, she was in such blinding pain, she couldn't even talk. They just began running her through a wide ranging series of tests to try to figure out what was going on. But when these results began coming in, either she was negative for the thing they were testing for, or it just came back that everything was normal. And so they're looking at Peggy, seeing her completely falling apart. None of their tests have revealed anything is wrong with her. And so they're at a loss. They don't know what's wrong with her. And so without a better option, they just put Peggy into a hospital room and begin monitoring her. And sure enough, after being in the hospital for three days, Peggy's symptoms would come down. While she wasn't back completely to strength, she was able to speak again. She was able to eat and drink water and move around. She was still very uncomfortable. Her heart would still race periodically and she would get fits of pain in all of her extremities. But overall, she felt like she was really improving. And so after three days, she was discharged from the hospital. And so Peggy and her family, they drive back to their home and initially everything's okay. It seems like she's on the mend, but within 24 hours, Peggy's heart starts to race again. And before long, her arms and legs feel like they are on fire. Now, Peggy and her family, they know that the doctors don't know what this condition is. And so their immediate reaction was huge concern that Peggy, again, was suffering from this horrible thing. But going to the hospital didn't really feel like the obvious first choice. In fact, the obvious first choice, at least for Peggy, was just to sit at the house and wait it out the same way she had waited it out at the hospital. But over the next several days, despite laying in bed and resting as much as she could, her symptoms did not get any better. They got worse and worse and worse to the point where she literally was completely bedridden and all she could do was just shake and periodically scream into her pillow from all the pain she was experiencing in her extremities. And so finally, on October 30th, which was 10 days from the first day that Peggy felt these strange symptoms when she was at the diner, her family decided you know what, enough is enough. She obviously is not able to just sleep off whatever this is. And so they called an ambulance, which rushed her to the hospital. And when she got there, the doctors, they remembered her from the week before. So they understood this was a bit of a mystery. But just in case, they ran the exact same battery of tests on her to see if maybe now there was some other indication of what this was. But again, all of the tests came back and they either came back negative or inconclusive or just showed that, you know, nothing was wrong with her. The doctors even ran her through some tests for poison, thinking, you know, maybe she accidentally ingested something toxic and that's what's causing all of this. But those tests as well came back negative. And so totally stumped, the doctors decided the only thing they could do was once again, put her in a hospital room and just monitor her. And so that night, Peggy was wheeled into a room and all night up and down that hospital wing, people listened to the sound of Peggy screaming at the top of her lungs from the pain she was experiencing. And then the next morning, the whole situation got even worse, not only for Peggy, who by now was dipping in and out of consciousness, but also for the rest of her family. Because that morning, Peggy's son, Dwayne, and Peggy's stepson, so Pi's son, Travis, they were both admitted to the same hospital for exhibiting the same symptoms as Peggy. Their heart was racing, they were nauseous, they were vomiting, and their arms and legs were starting to tingle. And so the doctors, with nothing else to do, just ran Dwayne and Travis through all the same tests they had put Peggy through, and they all came back negative or they came back normal. However, 
Shortly after Dwayne and Travis had been admitted to the hospital, a neurologist who was looking after Peggy, he noticed something about her condition and suddenly it was like his medical training from back in college kicked in and he remembered something very specific that lined up exactly with what he was seeing in Peggy. And he suddenly realized that he knew what was going on. And so he told his colleagues, they ran out and they got this very specialized testing kit that doctors very rarely use. It's only for this one really specific and very rare condition. And they tested Dwayne and Travis and Peggy. And sure enough, the next day the results came back and all three tested positive for this condition that the neurologist had guessed. And even though there was a cure for this condition, for Peggy, it was too late. Her body had been so completely ravaged that even if they administered the cure, it would not work fast enough to save her life. And so that day, the doctors went to Peggy, who despite being on all these painkillers is still squirming and writhing in pain and screaming into her pillow. They would tell her, you're gonna die. The only thing we can do is try to make you as comfortable as possible and then try to save your boys. Not long after being told this terrible news, Peggy would slip into a coma and then four months later on March 3rd, 1989, Peggy's family had to make the heart-wrenching decision to pull her off life support. And then at that point, she passed away. As for her two boys, Dwayne would remain hospitalized for two months and would make a full recovery. As for Travis, he would remain hospitalized for six months, and while he would recover, he would never walk normally again. Even though the actual medical condition that killed Peggy and nearly killed Dwayne and Travis was completely known at this point, everybody knew what it was. What nobody could figure out was why this happened. Why in the world did this happen to these people? It made no sense. However, shortly after Peggy's death, that mystery would actually begin to unravel in the most bizarre and totally roundabout way. There is an international organization called MENSA. That's not an acronym. It's a Latin word that roughly translates to table or mind. And this organization is a highly exclusive society for the ultra intelligent. You literally have to prove that your IQ, which is an intelligence test, ranks in the top 2% out of everybody in the entire world. And even then, you may not be smart enough to get in. And in the same town that Peggy and Pi had lived in Alturas, Florida, there was a chapter of Mensa. And the way some of these chapters worked is they would just get together every month and do some sort of intellectually stimulating activity. And in Alturas, that Mensa chapter, what they would do is they would get together at some private location once a month and they would put on what they called a murder mystery weekend. The members of this chapter would head off to some private location like an inn or a hotel or a cabin or something and they would all role play a murder investigation. So so one or two of the Mensa members would come up with a very elaborate murder and subsequent investigation, and they would assign different fake characters to each of the real Mensa members. And so once they got there, they'd all find out what character they were and what they were responsible for. And then once they got into character, which included dressing up in costumes, they would remain in character until the killer was revealed. And so this activity was meant to be extremely intellectually challenging, but also it was extremely fun. The group loved these murder mystery weekends. And so with that in mind, just a couple of weeks after Peggy had passed away, so this is sometime in April of 1989, a new genius was accepted into the ranks of the Alturas Mensa chapter. Her name was Sherry Gwynn, and she was a middle-aged woman who had recently fled from Texas to Central Florida to get away from her abusive husband, who still lived in Texas. After she was accepted into the Mensa chapter, it became abundantly clear to the members that Sherry was eager to make friends. But not just any friends. She wanted to make friends with two very specific members of the Alturas Mensa chapter. And they were Diana Carr, who had no relationship to Pi Carr or his family, and Diana's husband, whose name was George Trapal. Diana was a very successful orthopedic surgeon who had her own practice in Alturas, Florida. And George was this computer programmer who had more advanced degrees than you could count. And critically, Diana and George just so happened to live 
right next door to Peggy and Pie's house. Even though Sherry came on really strong right away to try to become friends with Diana and George, neither of them were phased. The couple just figured, you know, here's a woman who's living by herself. She's moved to a brand new area. She's run away from an abusive husband. You know, it's no wonder she wants friends. And so she probably just needs some support. And so Diana and George were happy to just become her friend. The same month that Sherry was accepted into the Alturas Mensa chapter, George and Diana happened to be chosen as the people responsible for coming up with the complicated scenario that the group would actually act out during their murder mystery weekend that month. So George and Diana very diligently sat down and went over how to make the case as complicated as they could. And George took on the responsibility of really focusing on exactly how the victim in their fake scenario would be killed because he was really trying to make it as difficult as he possibly could. And he was trying to find the perfect murder that would be nearly impossible to solve. And so he came up with his very elaborate murder scene. And then between him and what his wife was creating, they put together this really intense and very complicated scenario that they were both very happy about. And so a couple of days later, it was time to head out for the murder mystery weekend that George and Diana had worked so hard on. And so they went and printed off a whole bunch of those cards that would have all the information about who each of the Mensa members were going to be in this role playing game. And there was some initial information about the murder that was committed, the so-called perfect crime that George had come up with. And so they printed all those cards out, they grabbed their costumes, they packed their stuff up, they hopped in the car, and they drove to the nearby inn where they met up with the rest of the Mensa members, which included Sherry. And so they get to this inn, everybody checks in, and then afterwards, they all meet up in the lobby where George and Diana hand out their cards that have the information about the role-playing game. And so everybody's reading it and figuring out what they're going to do with their character, and everyone's also looking at the so-called perfect crime that George had come up with that he was also very proud about, and he was kind of boasting to the audience about how difficult this weekend was going to be. He really came up with the perfect crime. And so as all the members are reading their cards, Sherry would see the murder weapon used in this game and she would become fascinated with it. And she would make a point of going over to George and asking him lots and lots of questions about how he came up with this particular choice of a murder weapon and what actually happens when this is used on a person, not just in the game, but in real life. It was like Sherry had become obsessed with this exact form of murder. She was so interested in it. And George, he was immediately aware that Sherry was kind of unnaturally interested in exactly how he had come up with the scheme. But in a way, it was kind of flattering for George because he had spent a lot of time constructing it to make it as complicated as he could. And so he indulged Sherry and he sat there and told her everything about this particular weapon and what it does to the human body and you know how you can get it and what the history of this weapon was. And the whole time Sherry is just totally locked in. I mean, she's really focused on this particular style of murder. And so that murder mystery weekend would eventually come to an end and all the Mensa members would think it was great and they would head home. And then over the course of nearly a year after that, Sherry would be a near constant in George and Diana's lives. I mean, she was always around them. She always wanted to meet up with them. She was always talking to them and asking them questions and calling. And anytime she was with them, she always wanted to be with George. And when she was with George, a lot of times she would bring up that very particular murder method that he had come up with for the murder mystery weekend. And George just continued to think this was just the greatest thing. It was so flattering that she thought he was so smart that he had come up with the perfect crime. And so anytime she wanted to talk about it, he would just indulge her because it made him feel really good. And if George and Diana had seen any red flags in Sherry with her behavior towards them, they certainly didn't show it. They basically were operating under the assumption that Sherry, no matter what, was just this helpless, harmless person who had come to Central Florida and she was trying to be their friend. And so they should try to be her friend back. But as they would soon find out, they were very, very wrong about Sherry. In December of 1989, so roughly eight months after George and Diana had first met Sherry, Diana decided she wanted to move her medical practice from Alturas to a neighboring town called Sebring. 
And the drive from where their house was in Alturas to where her new office was going to be was just far enough that it made sense for George and Diana to relocate to Sebring. And when Sherry discovered that the couple was moving, she immediately called George and said, please let me rent out your house. I don't have a place to stay. I've been staying with friends. I'll pay whatever rent you want. And as it happened, George and Diana had actually talked about keeping the house and renting it out. And so it was actually a pretty easy decision. They trusted Sherry. And so they said, you know what? That's fine. You can rent out the house for a couple of months and then we'll decide if this is a long-term solution or not. And within just a couple of hours, Sherry was on Diana and George's doorstep with a sleeping bag and a small bag of toiletries ready to go inside. And so George and Diana, they grabbed the last couple of things they needed. And then as they walked out the front door, they gave their house key to Sherry and told her, you know, hey, if you need anything, just give us a call. And then George and Diana, they climbed into their car. And as soon as they had drove off and were out of view, Sherry dropped her things and she kind of looked around and then she ran inside of the house. And just minutes later, practically the entire Alturas Police Department came crashing through that front door after Sherry. And within an hour, the police department would find something that would not only reveal the true identity of Sherry and her true intentions, but it would also reveal the truth about what happened to Peggy and her family. A couple of days before Peggy first started feeling bad, when her heart started racing and her arms and legs began tingling at the diner, a couple of days before that, someone had placed eight Coca-Cola bottles, so full sodas, glass bottles, inside of Peggy and Pie's kitchen. And they set these eight drinks kind of tucked away inside of a storage nook. A couple of days later, the family discovered these sodas, but they didn't think anything of it. They figured somebody else in the family had bought them and left them in the kitchen, and so they were fair game. And so before long, Peggy and the rest of her family were drinking these Cokes. But Peggy, who was notorious for loving Coca-Cola, drank way more than anybody else. Well, it would turn out all eight of those Coca-Colas had been tampered with. They all contained a significant dose of the heavy metal called thallium. Thallium is odorless, it's colorless, it's tasteless, and even though there are very small trace amounts that naturally occur inside of our bodies, if there's even a little bit more than that inside of our bloodstream, it becomes lethal. And so when Peggy was admitted to the hospital the second time, around the same time that Dwayne and Travis were also also admitted that neurologist who was looking at Peggy, what he noticed about her condition was that her hair was starting to fall out. And that's when it clicked for him. He had this flashback to his medical training where he was taught about thallium poisoning. And one of the symptoms was hair loss. The other symptom was extreme pain in the extremities. And so the neurologist and his colleagues went and got a thallium test kit and they tested Dwayne and Travis and Peggy and they all came back positive for thallium poisoning. But the level of thallium inside of them was astronomical. The boys are lucky to have survived. They had 20,000 times the amount that naturally occurs inside of the human body. As for Peggy, she had an astounding 50,000 times the amount that naturally occurs, way more than was lethal. And so that was why the doctors told her, there's nothing we can do. Your body is basically already dead. You're just technically still alive right now. And so the rest of the family, besides Dwayne and Travis, would also test for thallium, and they would all, with the exception of one child, have elevated levels of thallium. However, compared to Dwayne, Travis, and Peggy, of course, you know, their conditions were negligible and they would all make full recoveries. And so the doctors realized fairly early on that this family has been poisoned. And so they contacted the police who launched an investigation. And right away, their primary suspect was Pi. He and Peggy had been fighting extensively before she fell ill. He also had that kind of abrupt hunting trip that lined up with the day Peggy started feeling sick. And so they're thinking, okay, well, did that have something to do with how he planted the thallium? And then also there was the fact that Pi worked at the phosphate mining company and so had actually access to fairly rare chemicals. However, upon closer inspection, Pi did not have access to thallium specifically. Thallium is incredibly rare and very expensive. 
and it just seemed odd that he would use thallium to poison and kill his wife, but he would also poison himself and his son, who he adored. It just didn't really add up. And so Pai would get ruled out as a suspect fairly quickly. But during one of his last interrogations, he would give the police something he didn't think was very valuable, but it wound up being very significant. He would say that three months before Peggy got sick, their family received a death threat. He opened the mail one day and there was this typed out note that said, your family needs to leave Florida in the next two weeks or you're all going to die. But Pi thought it was some stupid teenage prank and so he didn't think anything of it. And then when two weeks went by and they weren't dead, he just kind of forgot about it. And so after the police have ruled Pi out as a suspect, they didn't know where to turn. They had no other suspects. And so they just began focusing on who might have written this note. And that's where Sherry comes in. Sherry Gwynn was not a Texas transplant who had come to Central Florida to run away from her abusive husband. Sherry Gwynn wasn't even her real name. Her real name was Susan Galeck, and she had lived in Central Florida for most of her life. Susan was very smart, but she certainly was not Mensa-level genius smart. And so almost certainly her paperwork that got her in to the Alturas Mensa chapter was forged. Susan also had absolutely no interest in becoming real friends with Diana and George. The only reason she was pretending to be their friends and wanting to be around them all the time is because she was studying them. Because Susan was actually an undercover police officer. She had been sent undercover after the police discovered Diana and George were responsible for that death threat letter that was sent to Peggy and Pi. It would turn out Diana and George hated Peggy, Pi, and their kids. They hated them, they thought they were obnoxious, they were too noisy, they were annoying. And so Diana, who for context was the type of person who would stop people mid-sentence and correct them if they ever referred to her as anything other than Dr. Carr, she had gotten into at least one or two serious yelling fights with Peggy and with Pi and their kids when she had gone over to tell them to turn their music down and be quiet and do this and do that. And Peggy and Pi, they're not putting up with that. And they just told her to get out of here. As for George, he didn't get into any public altercations with Peggy and Pi and their family. George was a very meek and submissive guy. He was very meager and he was mostly a recluse, but he spent virtually all day peering out the window at Peggy and Pi and their family, studying what they were doing and obsessing over how noisy and obnoxious they were. And as he's seeing his wife getting more and more frustrated with their neighbors, George finally decides he's going to take drastic action. And so that's when George types out that death threat and he sends it across the way. But after Pi reads it, nothing happens. They don't leave Florida within two weeks. And so George went to phase two of his plan. George had actually spent time in a federal prison in the 1970s for cooking meth. And one of the byproducts of making meth is thallium. So George used his old meth cooking skills and he whipped up some thallium and he put lethal doses of thallium in eight different Coca-Cola bottles. And then after mixing them all up so you couldn't tell there was any chemical inside of them, he used his bottle topping machine to put tops back on top of each of them. George made his own beer and so that's why he had a topping machine at his house. And so with his eight deadly drinks all prepared, looking like brand new Coca-Colas, George waited until Peggy and Pi and her family were out of their house. And then he snuck over and he walked into their kitchen and he placed these Coca-Colas right down on the kitchen counter and he slid them into a storage nook. And then he left the house and that was it. And over the next several weeks, he watched with absolute pleasure as the family got sick and then Peggy died. While George never actually admitted that he had poisoned his neighbors, he did do some things that really tipped off Susan that he had to be the guy. Like for example, that Mensa mystery murder weekend, the murder method that George had come up with was poisoning. And remember, at that point, Susan has been sent undercover to find out if George and Diana are responsible for poisoning their neighbors. And now George is sitting up there talking about the perfect crime he's come up with, and it's poisoning. And so that was why she had followed up with him really specifically on, wow, what else do you know about poisoning? And how'd you learn about poisoning? And, and what kind of poisons do you know about? 
And over the following months, even though Susan never got George to actually admit to her when she was undercover recording him that he was the poisoner, she did completely earn his trust. And she did this by always making sure she was very submissive around him and always made sure to stroke his ego and remind him how smart he was. I mean, George was used to being in a relationship with Diana who was extremely overbearing and kind of kept him under her thumb. And so Susan kind of allowed George to feel like he was in control for once and he loved it and so he completely trusted Susan to the point where when he and Diana were going to move out of Alturas they were willing to rent their house to Susan and this is important because the house had not actually been emptied a lot of their things were still in the house including George's things and so he just assumed Susan would never go through his things but as soon as Susan was in that house and she watched George and Diana drive off she immediately called in backup the police swarmed the house they searched it top to bottom and in the garage they found George's chemistry equipment and nestled underneath it was a bottle that contained thallium George would be found guilty of first-degree murder as well as attempted murder on the rest of Peggy's family and he would be sentenced to death as of this episode he is still alive and he is still on death row. As for his wife, Diana, who many people believe must have had something to do with the poisoning or must have at least known it was happening, was never actually charged with anything. And so she would eventually divorce George and move on with her life and remarry. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to come ballroom dancing with you. But when you get out on the dance floor, just start stomping all over their feet and don't acknowledge it. On Wednesday, April 26th, 2006, a bright, beautiful, outgoing 18-year-old named Whitney Sarek began making her way across her campus towards her lecture hall where she had a class that morning. Whitney was a freshman at Taylor University, which is an evangelical Christian liberal arts college located in Upland, Indiana. Upland is a little town that sits about two miles east of Interstate 69 and is situated right between the two much larger cities of Indianapolis and Fort Wayne. As Whitney made her way along the pathway across campus and she passed by other throngs of students hustling to their own classes, she suddenly had a pang of anxiety as she realized the end of the school year was fast approaching. And while Whitney was definitely excited to head back home to rural Gaylord, Michigan, where she was from, to spend her summer vacation, she was also kind of bummed because she would have to say bye to all of her new friends in college that she wouldn't see again until after summer break in the fall when the next school year started. Whitney had made a ton of friends over the course of her freshman year, and by and large, they were other freshmen like herself. But she did have a few friends that were upperclassmen, because early in Whitney's collegiate career, she had discovered that upperclassmen were just as friendly as freshmen, and they came with the bonus of lots of experience and expertise. And if you just asked them for guidance or advice, they'd be happy to give it to you. And so over the course of the school year, anytime Whitney had an opportunity to interact with or be around upperclassmen, she would take it, thinking, you know, maybe I can learn something. And in fact, that morning, as Whitney was making her way across campus, she saw a sign that was asking for students to volunteer to the next day head out to this banquet hall to set up this big banquet for the school's new incoming president. And so when Whitney walked over to the table and asked the people what this was all about, she would learn that the majority of the people that had signed up to be volunteers so far were upperclassmen. And so as soon as she heard that, Whitney was quick to write her name down as well. The rest of the day would go completely as normal for Whitney. She would go to her classes, she would study, she would meet up with friends, and then eventually in the evening, she would make her way back to her dorm room where she would go to sleep. Little did she know, when she put her head down on the pillow that night, she was within 24 hours of her life changing in the most drastic way imaginable. The following morning, Whitney got up early, she took a shower, she brushed her teeth, and then she spent quite a while just staring at her wardrobe, debating which outfit she was going to wear, and then finally she chose the one she wanted and she got dressed. 
Whitney was not vain, but she knew the whole day would be spent around upperclassmen and university staff, and so she wanted to look her best. On her way towards her door to leave, Whitney would stop and look in her mirror one last time to make sure she looked okay, and in this fleeting moment, as she's looking herself up and down, she couldn't help but feel a justifiable sense of pride in this woman looking back at her. She had gotten into a great college, she had moved hundreds of miles from home and lived alone by herself for the first time, and her grades all year had been excellent. And so as Whitney's looking at herself, she thought to herself, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. Whitney's gaze would move from her reflection up to the clock on the wall and she would see she was running late. And so she quickly grabbed her jacket, she threw it over her shoulder, and she went out the door. When Whitney arrived at the meeting spot in the parking lot nearby, she saw there was a group of what looked like students standing around a university van. And so Whitney walked up to them, and sure enough, this was the group of volunteers. It consisted of seven other Taylor students, most of which were seniors, and one university staff member. And so Whitney didn't know any of them, and so she quickly introduced herself, everyone said hi, and then because Whitney was the last person they were waiting on, very quickly after she arrived, they were kind of ushered into the van, and then the van pulled out of the parking lot and began heading north towards Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne was where the banquet hall was. It was located about an hour north. At some point during this drive north, Whitney struck up a conversation with a 22-year-old senior named Laura Van Ryn, who was sitting right next to her. Whitney and Laura were total strangers, but they looked so similar physically, they were both tall, blonde, and very slim, that when they first got onto the van, one of the other volunteers actually asked them if they were related. But it wasn't just physical similarities that Laura and Whitney shared. Once they got to talking, Whitney would learn that Laura had also grown up in a small rural Michigan town. It was called Caledonia, and it was located only a couple of hours south of Gaylord, where Whitney had grown up. After the van finally arrived in Fort Wayne, the volunteers got out, they went inside of the banquet hall building, and for the next several hours, they set up tables and chairs, they put out silverware, they hung up decorations, and the whole time, Laura and Whitney just stayed close together, continuing their friendly banter. And then around 7 p.m., when the banquet hall was ready for the next day's ceremony, the volunteers decided their work was done, and so they left the banquet hall building, they piled back into the van, and began heading south back towards their campus. For the first few minutes of the ride, Laura and Whitney would just continue to chat with each other, but pretty quickly they, like the rest of the people in the volunteer group, just were tired from all the hard work of moving things around, and so they became quiet and began looking out the window, just kind of keeping to themselves. About 30 minutes later, when the van was within a couple of miles of their campus, Whitney would turn and look next to her at Laura, just for a second, and right as she did, Laura would actually look up and look at Whitney, and so for a really quick second, they made eye contact, and so Whitney kind of awkwardly smiled at her, and as Laura was smiling back at Whitney, Whitney realized something very strange. There was this bright light on the side of Laura's face, and then seconds later, that bright light had grown, and the entire interior of the van was completely whited out. And then a second later, someone towards the front of the van yelled, oh my god, no! And then the van went completely silent. Within minutes, dozens of 911 calls were coming in from motorists on I-69 saying that something terrible had happened. When first responders arrived on scene, they were braced for the worst, but even still, they were shocked at what they saw. Scattered all over the northbound and southbound lanes of I-69, not far from Taylor University, were all these huge chunks of jagged metal, there was glass everywhere, and there were bodies everywhere. That light that Whitney saw growing on Laura's face that suddenly filled the entirety of the van were the headlights of an 80,000 pound fully loaded tractor trailer truck driven by Robert Spencer. Robert was a truck driver and he was traveling north on I-69 when he fell asleep at the wheel, at which point his truck veered off the road into the grassy median between the northbound side and the southbound side of I-69. His truck bounced up onto the 
the southbound lane and crashed into Laura and Whitney's van. And when it did, the impact literally peeled off the side of their van and sent the van spinning. And so as the van is spinning, because of this huge opening in the side of it, the students inside were literally being violently thrown out of the van into traffic. When first responders finally actually began surveying the crash site, they would find Robert still in his truck, he was alive, but they would discover that of the nine occupants inside of that van, five were deceased. A few hours later, in the early morning hours of April 27th, Whitney Sarek's family back home in Gaylord, Michigan, woke up to the sound of a phone ringing. When one of Whitney's parents answered the phone, it was the Grant County coroner telling them their daughter had been in a terrible accident and she was deceased. At the same time, three hours south of Gaylord, Michigan in Caledonia, Michigan, the Van Rin family also was woken up in the middle of the night to a phone call, except the call they got was that their daughter, Laura, had been in that same crash, but she had survived, although she was in critical condition. In the days that followed, the Sarek family had Whitney's body transported to Gaylord, and then they began to plan for her funeral, a funeral that would have to be closed casket because of the extensive damage to Whitney's body. Meanwhile, Laura Van Rin's family rushed to Parkview Hospital in Fort Wayne, and they would find their daughter bandaged head to toe with a neck brace on, laying in a hospital bed in a coma. Doctors would tell Laura's family that even though Laura was now stable, there was no way of knowing if she would ever come out of that coma. And even if she did, she had suffered a serious brain injury, which likely would impact her ability to function. And so knowing that at best, this was going to be a very long road to recovery, Laura's family decided to move her from Fort Wayne back home to Michigan to a rehabilitation center in Grand Rapids that specialized in brain injury. And so while the Van Rins were in the process of moving Laura back to Michigan, the Sereks were in the process of saying their final goodbyes to Whitney. On April 29th, so three days after the accident, the Sereks would hold a visitation in their hometown of Gaylord. A visitation is a time for friends and acquaintances to come together and pay respects and offer condolences to the people that the deceased have left behind. For Whitney's visitation, more than 1,400 people attended, which was nearly half of Gaylord's total population. The following day, on April 30th, Whitney was buried. At the same time, Laura's family, who had been taking turns keeping a 24-hour bedside vigil with Laura in the Grand Rapids facility, were given some incredible news. Based on brain scans, it looked very much like Laura would wake up from her coma, although there was no timeline. Over the next couple of weeks, Laura remained comatose, but her body would slowly begin to heal and all signs seemed to be pointing towards her eventually making a recovery. And then on Tuesday, May 16th, so 20 days after the accident, Laura woke up from her coma. And amazingly, at first, it seemed like her brain was functioning the way it should be. The family could not believe their luck. This was a miracle. Over the next few days, Laura would slowly regain her strength to the point where she could move some limbs and she could sit up in her bed. And then as for her cognitive function, it seemed like she was making strides, but then she would do something that would make doctors and her family and everybody around her start to question if her brain really was okay. On Monday, May 22nd, so one week after Laura had woken up from her coma, she was sitting in her hospital bed with her physical therapist right next to her and her family was in the room as well. And at some point, her physical therapist handed Laura a pencil and then she put a pad of paper in front of her. And then the therapist told Laura to write a word down that was very specific. It was a word that Laura should know well and a word that Laura should be able to spell. And so after Laura kind of gave a nod saying she understood the assignment, Laura took the pencil and very awkwardly and painstakingly wrote out a word. But when she was done and the therapist looked at what she had written, it was wrong. It didn't make any sense. And so she asked Laura to do it again. And so Laura, with even more determination, would try to write this word. And once again, she wrote the same word, the same incorrect word. And so it was at this point that the therapist and the onlooking family started to realize that, you know, her injury to her brain might be more extensive than we thought. However, as everyone in that room would soon find out, that was not the case. 
there was something much, much bigger going on. Back on April 26th, just minutes after the car accident, first responders began moving about the crash site to figure out who was deceased and who was still alive. When they found Laura, she was barely clinging to life on the side of the road, and so they rushed over to her, they put her on a stretcher along with her purse, which contained her driver's license, they put that all together, they put her on an ambulance, and they sent her to the hospital. Once Laura arrived at the hospital, doctors would use her driver's license inside of her purse to identify her, and then they began wrapping her head to toe in bandages and casts. And when bandages began coming off over the following weeks, it was immediately obvious to everyone that this accident had significantly altered Laura's physical appearance, most notably her teeth. They almost looked like they had been shifted to one side in her mouth. However, to Laura's family, they didn't care how she looked. They only cared that she was still alive. But on Monday, May 22nd, when Laura was handed that piece of paper and a pencil and she was told to write her name, she did not write L-A-U-R-A -A, Laura. She wrote W-H-I-T-N-E-Y, Whitney. It would turn out a colossal mistake was made and nobody caught it until that moment. The woman sitting in the hospital bed with the pencil and paper was not 22-year-old Laura Van Rin. The woman sitting in the hospital bed was 18-year-old Whitney Sarek. When Whitney was found on the side of the road clinging to life, the first responders thought the purse next to her was hers. And so they opened it up, they found a driver's license, they looked at it and they looked at the victim on the ground and they looked identical. And so they said, okay, this is Laura. And amazingly, Whitney's purse that contained her driver's license happened to land on the ground next to Laura's body. And so Laura was misidentified as Whitney Sarek. A week after Whitney had written her name down on that pad of paper, it was officially confirmed that this was a case of mistaken identity. And so once again, the Sarek family received a call in the middle of the night from the Grant County coroner, except this time they were telling them that your daughter did not die in that car accident. She's alive. She's in Grand Rapids waiting for you. And so the Sarek family, they were completely shocked. They wanted this to be true, but it just seemed too good to be true. They had had a funeral for Whitney. They had buried Whitney, except because it was closed casket, they never saw Whitney. And so the Sareks hopped in a plane, they flew to Grand Rapids, and they walked into that hospital room, and there on the hospital bed was their daughter Whitney with her arms outstretched, crying, calling for her parents. While this, of course, was a miracle for the Sareks, it was, at the same time, a complete nightmare for the Van Rins. They had had their suspicions that something was off about their daughter, most notably her teeth, because they just didn't look like their daughter's teeth, but they had been told by the doctors and by anybody who would talk to them that it was perfectly normal for people involved in these very significant accidents to look completely different or even act completely different. And so the Van Rins just kind of put their suspicions to the side and focused on looking after their child and helping her recover. A few days later, Laura Van Rins' body, which had been buried in Gaylord, Michigan, under the tombstone that said Whitney Sarek, was exhumed and her body was flown to Caledonia, where the Van Ryn family was able to give their daughter a proper funeral and burial. Even though Whitney and Laura had only known each other very briefly during that volunteer event in Fort Wayne, their families would forge a bond over this shared trauma. And in 2008, two years after the crash, the Sareks and the Van Rins would co-author a book about their experience in going through this horrible event from each of their perspectives. That book is called Mistaken Identity, Two Families, One Survivor, Unwavering Hope. Also that year on April 26th, so the second anniversary of the accident, Taylor University would dedicate a prayer chapel to the five victims. Since the crash, Indiana has changed their state's protocols and procedures for identifying accident victims to ensure this type of mix-up can never happen again. As for Robert Spencer, the truck driver who caused the fatal accident, he would be sentenced to four years in prison. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to come over to your house for a sleepover, but then give them a bed with no pillows or blankets. <laughs>